All right, ladies, so it is, uh, what, January 12th, I think you will be seeing this uh, a week later, but um, we're in the, we're still in the midst of tough times, and so um, I want to acknowledge that. I also want to say, um, which I think in every class I've taken, they've said never do this as a teacher, but I do want to tell you that uh, this lesson has been hard for me to write and hard for me to plan, and so Every so often, um, as someone who's going to teach, you have a hard time coming up with a lesson. And I would say this week for me um, has been the hardest in years, just to kind of get a flow together or to really compile my thoughts well. So if I'm going to try my best and I don't want to displace like confidence or make you feel like I don't know what I'm doing, um, but I have prayed over it lots, and uh, I just pray that the Lord has something in here for us, even if it doesn't all come together perfectly. Um, and I do actually want to say as well um, that I am really going to focus this lesson on uh, the marriage contract in terms of God and Israel. And I think anytime we are looking at scripture through um, covenant eyes or marriage eyes, um, I recognize that it, it is a hard topic for many of us uh, who have broken marriages or have not found a spouse. Um, it, can, it always feels a little raw. So I just want to know that I specifically, too, have prayed for you this week um, that our, our disappointments in life and the ways that we have been uh, hurt and disillusioned um, would, would not impact uh, how we see God. Um, and I know there's always the risk of that. So I just want to acknowledge that before we get started. Um, and I also want to start by saying, like, in the midst of all this hard, um, as I kind of bring up this topic of Israel's covenant with God, um, I have had a good shepherd in my home, and I feel really blessed, and, like, it has been a huge gift um, to me. So Clayton has led me through a ton of difficult seasons in life, whether it has been uh, pregnancy losses that we've had, uh, difficult church situations, not at Northview, years ago that we have walked through together, and the real difficult waiting of three of our five kids that came home from Haiti. So we've had seasons of sleeplessness and seasons of brokenness, um, and we do know, all of us know, that the world is fraught with troubles. But Clayton and I came under a contract in 1998. We promised to walk these roads with each other. Um, and uh, when one kind of rebellious act I had actually in the midst of our wedding ceremony um, was, <laughs> Carla's laughing because we've talked about this already, but um, I, I don't know if this happens in weddings anymore, but when Clayton and I got married, uh, each of the mums would carry a candle to the front of the church and they would light um, a unity candle, so one candle, and then they'd place the two candles, so one that represented Clayton, one that represented myself, they would place them in their candle holders. And the tradition actually is that the bride and groom would walk to the front of the church and blow out their individual candles, signifying uh, that they were one. Um, and I absolutely refused to blow out my unity candle. I was still my own person. Uh, so, and we actually signed a legal document that day. And I have got to say, at the age of 24, um, all that that entailed, I really never thought about it. I was so casual about it. So we haven't always stuck to our wedding vows perfectly. We haven't always loved sticking to them, especially when we're annoying for each other or irritating to one another or when we've hurt each other. It costs a lot to love someone, and I'm more selfish than he is. But I did enter into a contractual agreement because I did believe he was who he said he was. Um, and I know that lots of us have not had a good shepherd in our homes or have lost one to death or to divorce or have never had it. Um, lots of you have experienced only selfishness or abuse or betrayal. And I'm sorry that you have. Um, and I, I get sad for what that does to our view of God. Um, and I want to acknowledge that you probably come to the table with a bit of a guarded heart because uh, you've been wounded. Um, so this may be tougher to grasp, but... I've been praying, and I want to pray now, because I want to talk about the marriage contract tonight. 
uh, and I want to engage that topic in light of Israel's relationship with God and how that reflects our relationship to Christ today. So we're first going to look at Israel in light of Micah 1 and 2 and then us in light of that. So Father, I just pray uh, right now you know uh, my lack of confidence in my planning and you know the difficulty at times of this topic. And so, Father, I just pray that um, you would pull things together for us and that we would be able to apply Micah chapter 1 and 2 uh, to our lives today. I pray, Father, um, that the, your message of grace and the gospel would come through clearly um, in the midst of heavy books and a heavy word. Uh, we love you and we thank you for your word and that it does give us life in your name. Amen. So we're in Micah 1 and 2 tonight, but I'm going to start actually in Matthew 22. I'm going to start in Matthew 22, uh, verse 36. And there was a lawyer that had approached Jesus, and this is what he said. Teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Or as the Luke 10 account goes, he says, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? What shall I do to be saved? And Jesus says, well, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And a second is equally important. Love your your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets, prophets are based on these two commandments. It's interesting what Jesus does here, because if you were a Jew at that time, the dearest thing to you was the Ten Commandments, was the law. Um, and the law included the Ten Commandments given in Exodus 20 and about 600 other ceremonial laws that streamed out of these. So somehow, these 600 and something can be stated in two commands like Jesus did. Jesus says there are two, the greatest two. And the two that he gives are actually rooted in Deuteronomy 6 verse 5 and Leviticus 19, 18. In Deuteronomy 6, 5, we have the Shema, the most holy words and the greatest words uh, for a Jew today. And it is, um, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, all your might. Um, the command is prefaced with who God is. You shall love God based on the truth of who he is. And how do you do this? Well, Moses is going to go on to explain that you live, you breathe, you eat, you sleep the commands of God. You teach them, you bind them, you recite them, you remember him, you love him. And Leviticus 19, 18 says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And it ends with, I am the Lord. So the command ends with the why they should obey because of who God is. So what has Jesus done? Well, in responding to the lawyer, he's directed him back to the Ten Commandments. But he's wrapped the Ten Commandments into two great commandments. And let's see how we got there. We're going to go right back to Exodus 20. You can open your Bibles. You can just listen to me. I'm going to probably be super speedy because I have nearly double the notes that I usually have. Um, <clears throat> so Israel's just been delivered from slavery by Moses in Exodus 20. They come, the Israelites come to Mount Sinai, where God is going to establish his covenant with Israel. This is where they will become his people officially, contractually, and he will become their God. So let's look at the at the Ten Commandments and uh, see how Jesus was able to summarize these into two. So let's take Commandments 1 through 4. So number one, you shall have no other gods. Number two, don't have any idols. No worshiping them, no serving them. Why? Because God is jealous and will punish sin but shows loving kindness to thousands, to those who keep his commands. Number three, don't take the Lord's name in vain. Number four, keep the Sabbath holy because it honors the God who created you. So these first four, then we go to the next six. Honor your father and mother. Don't kill or preserve life. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't lie. Don't covet. So the modern day, an ancient Jew actually saw this as the marriage ceremony between God and Israel. These were their vows. They celebrate, Jews today, the feast of the giving of the law as their wedding anniversary every year. And Jews today will still... Mary under a chuppah, and this symbolizes actually Mount Sinai over them. This was the marriage contract, the ketubah. Jews say this represents their love, their commitment, their respect, and their responsibility within the marital relationship. So God says in the first four vows, I am who I say I am. I can be trusted. Don't look at other men. Don't compare your husband to other women's husbands. Don't speak lightly about your husband. Honor his name with your words. And remember, the Sabbath is a day to rest with your beloved, to remember to make time for your marriage. So that's how the Jews would see those first four commands. 
These four revolve around our relationship with God, how to love him and how to honor him. And then the next six are really big asks. Honor your parents at all times. This isn't easy, and it's why it's a command. Don't murder with your hand or your tongue. Preserve life. Be faithful to people. Don't steal anything. Not just property or money. And we see Jesus actually in Matthew 5 saying, you've heard it said, don't murder. I'm going to tell you, don't hate anyone. You've heard it said, don't commit adultery. I am going to say, don't lust after another woman. So the laws go deeper. Don't steal the credit. Don't steal glory from God. Don't steal encouragement or praise. And then don't steal by withholding from someone. Be truthful. Be content. A covenant is a solemn binding agreement. Both parties receive benefits and both um, need to fulfill obligations. So as part of this covenant, both Israel and God had obligations. What are God's? Well, he said he would provide for their physical and spiritual needs. He said he would protect them from their enemies. And he said he would take responsibility for his people's well-being at every level. What are Israel's responsibilities? Obey God and be loyal to him. And this is what the response is as they receive these Ten Commandments. All that the Lord has spoken, we will do and we will be obedient. Moses takes the blood of an animal that's been sacrificed. He sprinkles the blood on the people and he says, Behold the blood of the covenant, which the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Okay, so in really simple terms, what do they need to do? The Ten Commandments have two emphases. The first four are on loving and honoring God. The next six have to do with treatment of others. Good treatment of others honors God. Good treatment of image bearers shows love for our neighbor. So Jesus was pointing the lawyer back to the Ten Commandments, and he'd summarize the Ten Commandments in two easy things to remember. And what did God give as his people fulfilled their end of the covenant? We well, gave them freedom. He'd freed them physically, and he had a plan to keep them free spiritually. So did they keep it? And were they free? Well, we can step into Micah for the answer. The book of Micah is the court case dealing with Israel's breach of contract. They didn't fulfill their end. They've broken the covenant. In fact, when we get to Hosea in the first three chapters, uh, the, the first three chapters of Hosea are very graphic about this. He says, God says that Israel's been whoring about with other gods. That's the language in the NASB and the ESB. They've been prostituting themselves. They've committed adultery. They've left him. So we're just in our first week of Micah. So let's talk about the book for a minute, set ourselves in context, and then move on. So this is Micah of Morasheth, and his name, Micah, means who is like God. And he's going to take the entire book to answer this question. And he's going to use a really interesting play on words in chapter 7 to bring this theme out even a little more. He's a regular guy from southern Judah, just like Amos was. And uh, I loved what a commentator said about this. It's the heart that matters. The heritage doesn't when it comes to God's call. He equips the called. He doesn't necessarily always call the equipped. So Amos was a farmer. Micah was a regular guy. He used them to preach uh, the message that he needed his people to hear. He is prophesying at the same time as King Jotham, King Ahaz, and King Hezekiah of Judah. Uh, So we know what those times looked like. King Jotham had great personal obedience to God, but it made no impact in the nation at all. King Ahaz, his son, was one of uh, Judah's most evil kings. He sacrificed his own children uh, to idols, and he completely shut down worship of God through the nation. His son Hezekiah comes to reign at about 16 years old, and he opens the temple doors again, restores worship in the nation of Judah, and reteaches them who God is. Remember, this is all the same time as winter houses, summer houses, marble houses, cows of Bashan, idol worship. 
Um, and in the midst of this, Micah lays out three prophecies. And so we had to see how these were divided this week. And we see each prophecy start with the word here. So hear this, and he addresses a group of people. So in chapters one and two, he has one prophecy. It starts with here, and it ends actually with a really hopeful message in the last two verses that we're going to get to eventually. Um, and then we see ver- uh, chapters three and five is the second message, and chapter six and seven is the third. Um, So Mike is probably prophesying over a period of about 50 years. Two really important dates happen within the midst of his uh, ministry. In 722 BC, he will watch the nation of Israel be captive uh, by Assyria. He'll see them be exiled. And so what he's going to prophesy specifically, he's going to watch happen. And then in 701 BC, we see the Assyrians... uh, um, surround Jerusalem. We saw this in the story of Hezekiah, but they don't take Jerusalem. God provides and protects his people. So he's going to see those two things happen in his life. So when there's a breach of covenant, there's a charge and there's a judgment passed down. And we're going to see that in chapters one and two. This is a court case. Chapters one and two are the summons and the indictment. Judgment is pronounced. And in a way you could say bail is set. Who's the witness for the prosecution? We see in Matthew or Micah 1 verse 2, the Lord himself is a witness against them. And who's the plaintiff? Well, in a way you could say Moses, uh, the writer of the law, inspired by God, given by God, but he is the one that laid down the law for Israel. He is the one that helped enact the covenant. So what's the law that has been broken? What's the offense that's been committed? What is the breach of contract? It's the Mosaic covenant initiated by God, entered into on Mount Sinai, Israel's marriage contract. So the two defendants, Israel and Judah, are summoned. Chapter 1, the indictment, you've not obeyed the first four commands. Chapter 1 focuses on those first four. You have high places where you worship other gods. The practice of idolatry is the committing of adultery, and he calls it rebellion in chapter 1, verse 5. So in Micah 1, 2 to 4, we see that God is coming from his high place to your high place, and that is not a good thing. He is leaving his heavenly throne room, the temple in heaven, and he's coming to your high place, which is where you worship idols. His high place is the throne. Your high place is full of gods you've replaced him with. And in verse 5, he names the contractual breach. God expected loyalty. Instead, Israel's rebelled. They've bought the age-old lie that God is holding out. Do you remember that from Genesis 3? Eve believed it too. So they have affair after affair after affair. They become loyal to other gods. And this is the spiritual law here, ladies. Who you pursue or what you pursue and love and chase after is who or what you become loyal to. So what's the judgment pronounced? Well, it's destruction, captivity, and exile. And we see this in verses 6 and 7, the destruction of everything you've put before me. You don't only lose them, you lose me too and all I said I would do. All the ways I promised to love you, the high places are going to be left as waste. All her idols will be smashed. All of her earnings will be burned with fire and all of her images I will make desolate. God's people are cheating on him with other gods and they're giving their worship and service to other gods. A consistent habit of idolatry and idolatry described here is adultery. So we have a reaction from the prophet in verses 8 and 9, which I'm going to talk about later. And then in verses 10 to 15, we see Micah use a play on words on all the cities um, that are going to describe the judgment of Judah and Israel and to describe what the destruction will be like. So the first charge against Judah and Israel, all of chapter 1, is spiritual adultery, loving other things more than God. Um, And Jesus' two commands really frames these two chapters. His first command, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, uh, is what the Israelites didn't do in Micah chapter 1. Now chapter 2, tough to sort out who is who in here. In verse 1 and 2, uh, Israel scheming, coveting, stealing. We actually have the exact same language, the commands broken um, in the Ten Commandments 5 to 10. Um, In verse 8 to 11, we see oppression, hatred, and lying. And verse 3 to 5, God reiterates what their destruction will be. In verse 6, the people are saying, stop laying such a heavy message on us. Stop preaching. Stop making it so hard. Preach to someone else. It's not as bad as you say it is. And Micah's response is, I must. 
I have to speak out against these things and give you a chance to respond. In verse 7, God says, am I really impatient? Are you accusing me of that? Aren't my words good words? Aren't my words good to the one obeying them? So what has Israel done in a nutshell? Broken the contract. Chapter 1, betrayed her husband by taking other gods. Covers commandments 1 to 4. In chapter 2, she's offended and broken commandments 5 to 10. Almost word for word. She's not loved people. Jesus says, love God with your whole being. Love your neighbor as yourself. And that sounds easy enough. But what about us today? How is Micah 1 and 2 going to speak to us and inform our thinking and living? Remember when I said that it had been easy to enter a contractual agreement with Clayton? Well, I believed he was who he said he was. I believed the truth claim behind what he presented to me. So we agree with entering into a contract that involves some duties that we must enact because we believe the truth that it's going to be good for us, that it will benefit us. So I kind of want to use a, a picture, and I'm actually going to give Carla a literal picture to put on the screen. Uh, but this is a picture of Masada. And so if you ever visit Israel, you will no doubt visit this. It's a fortress built by Herod. It is situated at the top of an isolated rock cliff at the western end of the Judean desert. It overlooks the Dead Sea. And on the east, the rock falls in a sheer drop of about 450 meters. There's no rails here, but there are signs. Um, and there are signs that basically say don't come too close to the edge or you will be at risk of falling. Um, and they seem like pretty simple commands. You actually see the risk in front of you. Not difficult to obey. You just don't have to walk one step too far. But in order to obey, we all test the truth claim behind an instruction or a command. So I have to believe that it's actually possible for me to fall 450 meters to my death if I don't stand a certain distance back from the edge of the cliff. But not everyone believes this. And I know this because several deaths occur there every year. But what's the truth claim behind God's Ten Commands to Israel? Um, it's the same truth claim behind every New Testament command we read. It's his character. We trust the command is good because he is good. We trust the command is obeyable, even if inconvenient, because he's given us a new heart with desires to obey and the strength to do it. So if we approach any one of these commands with a sense of rebellion, the issue isn't with his word. It's our lack of trust or our lack of belief. Or a sense of, I know better. So in Micah, he's, God says, isn't my word good to the one who upholds it? Yes, it is. His believed and obeyed word means freedom for the believer. Freedom from the enslavement that sin and rebellion bring. So he demands the same loyalty today, ladies. And this is where we get on touchy ground. So let's do this. And please trust me, I'm not going to lead you down a path of legalism. But I am going to try and convince you. Uh, we resolved as teachers that we'd mimic the tone of the prophets and we'd state boldly the message of the prophets. We'd bring the hard word if it were needed and deal with the sin in the passage and give the comfort that is always present there. So the sin in Micah 1 and 2 was the breaking of all Ten Commandments. It was not obeying God's clear commands. So it, New Testament, I'm going to talk about those commands in a minute, but I first want to read Matthew 28, 19, which is our disciple-making passage. So Jesus says this, he came and spoke to his disciples saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And then here's the next part, teaching them to observe all that I commanded, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded. So honestly, the first complication is knowing the commands. There are some large signs at Masada with one really clear instruction. It's easy. There are 1,050 commands in the New Testament. But, good news, you can group them all under 800 headings. Obey your parents, submit to your spouse, give to the Lord, tend to the orphan, obey your government, don't fear, don't worry, don't steal, don't lust, don't hate, love your enemy, rejoice in your trial, be salt and light, flee immorality. 1,050 commands I need to keep. In fact, Jesus took the commands to a new level in Matthew 5 uh, when he said this actually goes to the heart level. Uh, yes, but 
and I'm just reporting what I think some of the times. I can adjust some of these based on my circumstances and my needs. I'm a student. I'll give later. I did that one for years. Father, this massaging of the truth is going to help a lot of people, and it doesn't really compromise much. The government already takes so much of my money. A little number shift here is going to be okay. I'll be able to give the extra to missions. The problem is the state of our hearts and our view of his commands and our desire to obey. So I think the Jews in Micah very well could have done this. Okay, So I'm not saying this is exactly what the text says, uh, but the way they would have known the law and the things that they were doing so let's just imagine this. The Lord promised every 50 years a year of jubilee. For the Israelites that had to sell their property or had to sell themselves into servitude because they were um, in a financially difficult place, God gave them hope. The Lord provided a way out. So they were set free every 50 years. So if you had to sell your land 35 years after the last jubilee, you knew that in 15 years the Lord would release it back to you. So you knew it was for a short time. So we see in Micah chapter 2, people that were scheming on their beds and trying to find ways to take a widow's home and her children's inheritance. So could they have been thinking, well, I can get away with it because it's all going to be returned on the 50th year. But the condition of their hearts is the real problem. They're okay with the oppression of other people. They've rejected God's law by justifying the reasons they need not obey it. So they weren't loving God. And they were not loving their neighbor. They'd rejected God full out, or they hadn't rejected God full out. They just felt like they could add some other things, be loyal to some other things to a degree, uh, and they'd massage the contract to serve them better. So what happens if I adjust for my circumstances on Masada? I haven't believed the truth claim behind the sign, and I won't live. So what about the commands of God for us today? The commands of God, or the commands of Jesus, or the commands of the apostles. And they really still all come down to two. So... Um, I'm on the right page here, yeah. Questions we kind of got to ask ourselves in light of Micah 1 and 2. Am I finding reasons to not obey? So am I justifying why it looks different from me? Am I de not depending on the grace of God? Or am I depending on the grace of Christ and the return of Jesus one day to make all things right to not live rightly today? For some reason, I'm not believing the truth claim behind the command. And what are the truth claims behind every command in the New Testament? Number one, the character of God. His law represents who he is. Number two, I'm not believing that obedience is better than sacrifice or that obedience is that big a deal. I'm not believing there's a cost when I don't obey. And then the third one, here's the clincher. John 14, 15 says this. If you love me, Jesus says this, you'll obey my commands. So I'm proving who I really love. Other things other principles, other thinking, other people, usually myself. Our obedience is reflective of our love. Jesus says that clearly. And it's hard to hear because it immediately reveals something about me if I know I'm walking in rebellion to any of his commands. The call to be a disciple of his comes with a warning on the label. Leave your life, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. Not just follow me in the good things I give you, which is kind of why I married Clayton. I just thought all good things. He's saying follow me in the sacrifices you'll need to make. I have your best interests in mind. I love you to death. Literally, I love you to death. I love you more than your perceived freedom will. I love you more than the new outfit you bought. I love you more than your Netflix and wine. I love you more than your career or your kids or spouse ever will. I loved you to death. So our application of Micah 1 and 2 must be this. Is there anything of rebellion in me? I'm asking us all to honestly search. And I've, I have been doing this as well in the last few weeks and honestly months as we take in the minor prophets. I want to take away any justification that I can find 
Is there any rebellion in me? Is there any command I don't want to obey or I've justified getting out of obeying? There will be a cost, even just in my relationship with God. But at the heart of it is, is I'm not believing something about God and I'm not loving something about God. We obey the commands we're not sure about, the ones we don't like, the ones we feel are not for us at this time. And then we have to ask ourselves, do I love him? The ultimate Christian life is obeying out of love, not out of duty. Duty comes into it. But ultimately, can we obey because we love him so dearly, obeying out of gratitude, chasing after his commands? Listen to Psalm 119, 32. I chase after your commandments because you've set my heart free. Um, I'm reading Keller, Tim Keller's book on prayer right now, and it is a relief to read um, from people you think must have their entire Christian life together um, to hear actually how they have struggled along the way. So he says he knew the command was that he needed to pray, and he was well into his pastoral ministry before he's like, no, I actually really need to obey this command. He and his wife, Kathy, uh, resolved to each other that they would pray daily for each other every night before they went to bed, and he says it took him two years of duty in prayer because he knew he needed to, because he knew it was a command, until it actually became a delight for him. We dutifully obey because we trust him. We ask that he turns our duty to delight, and some commands will always just be hard, but we can do hard things. The Spirit is in us. We have the promise of heaven. We have been promised trial and tribulation, ladies, in this life, but the one in us is the one who's overcome the world. Think about the order of this. This is key. God delivered Israel, and then he gave them commands. Out of their love and gratitude for their deliverance, that's where their obedience should have been rooted. Think about the order of this, you and me. Saved from our depravity, from hell, from a life of ruin, to eternal life, spirit indwelling help, presence of God forever, and then the commands come. The imperatives, the commands, are built out of indicatives, truths of who God is, of what he does, and now who we are as new creations. So, Always the question, Genesis 3, did God really say that? That by obeying him, seemingly restricting myself and paying a high cost, that that would be freedom? He did. And the enemy will twist it. Oh, Angie. Oh, Heather. Oh, Andrea. Oh, Cindy. There is a way out of this one. Let's adjust for the times. Come back to it later. So is there anything in me of rebellion? I, I feel a lack of perceived freedom. I can't spend my money the way I want to, whatever. And then is there anything in me of disbelief that I believe through this command God is holding out on me? So over time, I'm going to use this word carefully, I found obedience easier and easier. The more I trust him and the more I love him and the more I've experienced his faithfulness as I draw my agenda and see his faithfulness when I obey the hard things, he doesn't make it easy. The commands are not easy, but he does give me a deep sense of wonder and peace and joy when I actively chase after his commands, when I fend off the rebellion or selfish interests that I would rather give in to. Um, made me think of something actually that uh, Adrian Dix said last week. And I remember sitting at my desk, I was sitting across from um, Joshua Scott and Levi Friesen, and we all had our earbuds in and we were listening. And Adrian Dix said, um, oh, how did he word it? If we are not uh, chasing the virus out, we are inviting the virus in. And all of us looked up and we're like, oh, a doctrine of sin. Um, kind of a weird way to hear it, but there it was. So. I am, um, where did I want to end here? Yes, uh, I, I love the peace and joy I have when I actually fight off my selfish interests that I would rather give in to. I know he has my best in mind. The truth claim behind his command is his character. He helps me obey. So I am by nature a lazy person. I got to tell you, I get the greatest joy. I get giddy when I've cleaned my car or put the recycling where it needs to go, or I've stuck within the budget because I know it delights Clayton, and he's always shocked when I've done any three of those things. He hasn't commanded me to do them, but I love doing it. 
because I know he loves it and I love him. Um, that's in a good season. So who does Micah show us is behind the commands? We'll look at Micah 1, verses 8 and 9. We get a picture of Micah's response. Because of all this, I must lament and wail. I must go barefoot and naked. I must lament like the jackals. And the jackals lady is thinking about coyotes in the middle of the night screeching. For her wound is incurable. For it has come to Judah. It has reached the gate of my people, even to Jerusalem. So we see Micah wailing and lamenting. As a prophet man, this is as much as he can do. Call out their sin, preach repentance, and lament over his, their choices. But we have a better Micah. And in Luke 19, we read this. When Jesus drew near the city, he wept over Jerusalem. And he's saying, you missed it. You missed me. You didn't know the time of your visitation. He is lamenting and weeping over their uh, turning away. In Matthew 23, he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you weren't willing. The better prophet Jesus called out sin. He preached repentance and forgiveness, and he lamented, and then he did more. He enacted a new covenant. Reminiscent of Exodus 24, he initiated a new contract. And his end? Well, he said he would provide eternal life, forgiveness of sins, perfect obedience. He closed in his yes, that we would be closed in his yes to the commands of God and every command he perfectly obeyed. How is this contract signed? <clears throat> his blood. Hebrews 9.15 says, Therefore Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, a better covenant with better promises, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance now that he's died to redeem them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. Matthew 26.28, Jesus says, This is my blood of the new covenant, the new contract, which I'm going to make so I can forgive your sins. My end? I just say yes. Yes, I'll follow you. I know it means denying myself, leaving what I think I need and love. I want to love you with my whole heart, mind, soul, and strength. This is the gospel call. We just have to have signed and said, yes, I'll take on your perfection. I'll take on your obedience. I will um, try as best as I can to love you with my whole being. So here's the relief. We will not obey perfectly. He did, but we must want to obey. We must work to obey. Not because it earns us anything, but because it's our greatest gift of gratitude to him. It is always hard to balance a call to obedience with the reality that we won't. The call to obedience can have a heavy feel of legalism if it's not taught alongside the gospel of the obeyer. Jesus loved his father's commands because he loves his father. We should love his commands we should want to obey. So who else does Micah show us is behind the commands? What else is the truth claim behind these commands? Well, in Micah 2, 12 to 13, it says, I will surely assemble all of you, Jacob. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. I'll put them together like sheep in the fold. He'll be a shepherd. Like a flock in the midst of its pasture, they will be noisy with men. The breaker goes up before them. They break out, pass through the gate, and go out by it. So their king goes on before them and the Lord at their head. The one behind the commands is the good shepherd who feeds, who provides, who leads, who directs, who guides, who comforts. The one behind the commands is the perfect king who only has good commands that will keep his people safe and happy. But see the warning here. The shepherd king delivers the remnant, a small portion. It means that most of Israel won't listen to Micah's warning. Some will. So Jesus also said that the path to destruction is wide, and many would take it. And the path to salvation is narrow, and few will find it. A remnant will. So let's heed the warnings Micah gives. Love the Lord with all our heart, our soul, mind, and strength, and our neighbor as ourself. The word of God is good. The words of God are good because God is good. 
And we want to hear it, even the hard ones. Because God, the God behind the truth claim, is your shepherd king. God was the husband to Israel, and we the bride of Christ. So ladies clothed in white. I just imagine this, opening the door of the church to the aisle that will reveal your good and loyal, true bridegroom, Christ himself, waiting patiently, paying it all, delighted in your devotion and loyalty to him alone. So Jesus obeyed perfectly, and he credited it to us. But did he obey so we could sin all the more? so that more grace may abound. May it never be, as Paul would say. May we never have the attitude of he obeyed perfectly, account credited, free living as I want. We honor and acknowledge his sacrifice by making our own. The fact that we have the perfect obeyer doesn't negate the fact that we're called to obey. Life to the full is a life of obedience. So these are the signs in me when I'm resisting following. I don't sleep. I'm anxious. I am pretty constantly angry or embittered. Then I lack peace and joy. I I find myself in bondage to the ways that I'm thinking and living. And often it's because I'm not turning my thoughts over to him. I'm not forgiving an offender. Um, I'm not getting what I think that I want. You have a shepherd king who wants you, mucky rebellion and all, and he wants to gather you like hens. We've got to let him. We have to let go of my way is best and surrender and submit to our master. He wants all of us, and and it will be true freedom. So here's proof in the pudding of where we're really at. 1 John 5 verse 2 says this. We know we're his um, if we love God and obey his commands. Loving God means keeping his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Again, not perfectly, but we want to, and we work to. Um, I did uh, my Bible reading in Genesis 22 this week. It's the story of Abraham. He is asked and actually commanded to do the most outrageous thing, to take the son that he has waited for for 95 years um, and to sacrifice him on an altar to end his life. That's the ask. That's the command. Well, we don't have any report of Abraham questioning it. He had learned through his life that God was faithful, that God was good. And he said, yes, Lord, I will. So he carries his son Isaac um, up to the altar and ties him on it. And as he is about to slay him, an angel of the Lord stops him. And the Lord says, now I know that you fear me. Now I know that you love me because you obeyed me. God defines evidence of love as obedience. So let's chase after his commands. Rejoicing in the shepherd king who after his lament paid the price for our inability to obey fully. Clothing us with his righteousness. Let's obey because we love him. Let's delight in obedience. Let's be honest about our rebellion and not be as the children of Israel who told Micah to stop preaching the hard message. We have a better hope. We have a perfect report card. We have the ultimate bridegroom. And we have a secure future. Now go back to your groups um, and discuss what you've learned about God and the hope that he offers.
Christ is-